Gracious God, whether there is snow outside or blinking lights, whether we are happy or sad, you call us to listen for your word in whatever ways we are able. On this day, may your word be made manifest through stories from Paul and through our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, like every week, we have a prayer of confession. And afterwards, we hear an assurance of pardon. And quite often, we hear these words in particular. In Jesus Christ, your sin is forgiven. During Sunday worship, we are assured that God has heard our confession, and we are reminded that Christ gave his life, that we might have forgiveness of sins. Through our worship, we can be confident that the one true God has created us and claimed us. We can be certain that we are God's beloved children, and we've been forgiven through Christ, that we might have new life. Every week we hear again and again that we have been justified by our faith in Christ. God's grace reaches across the eons to embrace us securely as God's people. And the question we've been asking in Sunday school, and I ask all the time, but how does this belief make a difference in our own lives? On Sunday mornings, we are reminded that we are justified by God's grace through Christ but do we realize that this is not the end of the story? Instead, our justification symbolized for us in the act of baptism welcomes us into the community of faith. Our justification symbolized for us by the sacrament of Holy Communion opens the doors to the Christian life. And yet justification in and of itself does not make us Christians. Our faith alone does not save us. This doesn't mean that faith isn't important. Although our faith is not the cause of God's lovingness, it is the indispensable means by which we accept and live from God's love. Faith alone does not make us right with God. It is God's grace in Jesus Christ that heals our wounds and forgives our sin. Faith is our acknowledgement that this is true. Now, justification is one of those terms that preachers throw around time by time because the biblical text witnesses to this word, to the reality of justification, particularly through the words of Paul. This morning we look at Corinthians, but first we hear these words from Romans. Paul clearly testifies before us, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace through God with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Being justified by faith, we have peace through God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there's another word that is often tossed from the pulpit less. This is a concept often confused with justification or simply misunderstood. If we listen to our verse from our passage in 1 Corinthians, we hear one form of this word. We're in 1 Corinthians, and this is verse 2. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This text points to the idea of sanctification. So what does it mean to be sanctified in Christ Jesus? What does it mean to, when this theological jargon is put before us? And Paul's good about that sometimes. Sanctification isn't meant to be jargon, but sometimes I think that's all it is. Basically, sanctification tells us about what happens after we've been justified by God. Having faith that God's grace through Jesus Christ offers us forgiveness and salvation is only one part of the story of the people of God. For having faith is only the beginning of the Christian life. Living our lives as though we have faith 
is the other part of the story. The book of James tells us, what good is it, my brothers or sisters, if you say you have faith, but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if there are no works, is dead. What this says is if we claim to be Christians, then we are obligated to act like Christians. We bring money for St. Clement's Food Bank because we just don't say to people, oh, go eat, have good, be at peace. We actually act out our faith. We must reach out to those in need even if they are not close friends or members of our family. We must strive to seek justice for ourselves and everybody around us. We must reach beyond our own comfort and well-being and extend the hand of Christ into the midst of a world that is filled with violence and prejudice, apathy, and despair. This is what it means to be a Christian. And when we fail, which we all will, we are called to try again and again. We are called to remember that through Christ, God has claimed us once and for all. We're never lost. We're always claimed, but we forget. We are called to remember that we are justified, and with this memory, we are called to allow the Holy Spirit to open us to the reality of God's love and mercy, sanctifying us each day to strive, however imperfectly, to reach out to others. Dr. Shirley Guthrie's book entitled Christian Doctrine may help us better understand how justification is distinct from sanctification. Justification tells us how a person becomes a Christian. Sanctification tells us how a person grows in Christian life. Justification tells us about God's gracious action towards us. Sanctification tells us about our response with obedient action to God. Justification that tells us that God is for us, forgiving us, saving us from our sin. Sanctification tells us that by the Holy Spirit, this same God works in us helping us to leave our sinful natures behind and begin a new and radically different form of life, again and again and again. In justification, the covenant-making God makes a promise, I will be your God. In sanctification, the same, people also, the same God also gives an inescapable command, you shall be my people. Justification tells us that Christ died for us. Sanctification tells us that the same Christ is our Lord who commands us to live in love. Justification tells us that God adopts us to be God's beloved children. And sanctification tells us that God expects us and helps us to live as God's children and therefore as brothers and sisters of one another. Justification and sanctification are related as gift and task, creed and deed, theology and ethics, faith and life. We're receiving and giving all at the same time. No one is a Christian until he is both, or he or she are both justified and sanctified. Now, in many respects, justification is the easy part, for this is the part that is 99% the working of God. 1% our work. On the other hand, sanctification requires human participation and effort. It's a 50-50 partnership. God has provided us with all the resources and the motivation to live our lives. We have energy, and we have to share it. We have love, and we have to give it. As I was thinking about justification and sanctification, you know, and I've said a lot of words, and I've said both those words a lot of times, but, you know, for me, because I'm different, um, I started pondering the game of baseball. These two theological ideas, justification and sanctification, seem to be demonstrated for us imperfectly, metaphors are never perfect, by the game of baseball. And although it's January and there's cold weather and snow, I have friends who remind me all the time, spring training's only a few weeks away. Now, I do not follow baseball like a lot of people. 
My brother, he can tell you everything. A friend of mine, Connie, wrote a book about baseball, the St. Louis Cardinals, and it came out right before Christmas. I gave one to my brother, and he's looking through, and he goes, I've already seen three mistakes. <laughs> I didn't tell Connie that, but you know, she needs a better, she needed my brother to edit the book. That's all I would say. It's a great book if you like baseball history. I don't follow baseball consistently even. Rather, I follow baseball as it connects me to my past, and I've probably said this out loud before, and as it speaks to me as a symbol for how we are to live our lives. You may have thought about that before or not. Baseball is a game that is simple and yet quite complex. It requires finesse and timing. It requires skill and flexibility. Baseball is about the individual player, but it is also about the team. Baseball, like the body of Christ, needs every player on the field to do his or her job to the best of their ability for the team to be able to do well. Every position in baseball is important, just like every member of a church community. If no one is standing out in right field, when the fly ball is hit over the head of the first baseman, trouble lies ahead. If no one is here to greet people or prepare communion or type the bulletins or sing the hymns or pray the prayers, trouble lies ahead. Okay, so we can tie the team metaphor with the body of Christ, but what does this have to do with justification and sanctification? I'll probably tell you. Now, I know everyone's probably not a fan of baseball, but I do hope you've seen at least one game in person, not on TV. It can be Little League. I mean, there's baseball everywhere. Little League, high school or college, church league, or professional league. TV's okay, so if you've at least seen it. But try to picture a baseball diamond, perfectly measured lines from home plate to each base. It's always perfect, and it's always the same. A pitcher's mound is in the middle of the diamond, and the green grass, you know, unless you're just making up a game and you're playing in the street, but basically in the real baseball game, little league or whatever, or softball, the grass, the green grass surrounds everything. You know, being from St. Louis, where baseball cardinals reign supreme off and on through all the decades, they've had a little slump since 2011, but. You know, they have been in the playoffs, but they just haven't won since then. Almost all my friends played Little League or Church League. I mean, now girls played softball back then. We didn't play baseball, but we played in our backyards, in the middle of the street, at the park after school, all summer long. Now, my terrible sadness is I'm a mediocre player. I can throw and I can catch but really, whatever it means to keep your eye on the ball, shh, I can't do that. Oh, that always made me sad. I once got a double, but I'm sure that was by accident. I walked a lot because I was tall, and so the, you know. Anyway, although I played baseball or softball in different forms throughout my life, usually when I picture a baseball game, I picture, a, you know, I'm at a stadium. Whether it's the Pirates or the Cardinals or the Nationals or Houston, I haven't, you know, there's, I've been a, a number of places, minor league teams, it's always fun. But it's always the same, there's some consistency about it. You know, you arrive at the stadium and there's a whole bunch of people. There's excitement in the air, especially if you're rooting for one team or the other. And there's also the smell of popcorn, it used to be cotton candy, I don't know, do they even sell that anymore? Of course, nowadays, you can get anything from prime rib to tacos to hot dogs. But if you could have you know, prime rib, why would you want a hot dog? But anyway, and it's all way too expensive. But excitement mounts until the players run onto the field to begin the game. It is this moment, that moment when the players run onto the field, that I tie in with justification. The players carry the gifts that God has given to them onto the field. They've been justified to play. They believe that they are free to pursue this game within certain parameters with all the freedom and finesse that they have. Sanctification, however, begins when the umpire yells, play ball. 
Yes, the players have been freely chosen to start the game, but it is expected that they will share their skills with the team to help them move to victory. In an ideal game, every player on the home team is alert and in position as the first batter steps to the home plate. The team's goal, led by the pitcher, is to make sure everyone who steps into that batter's box never finds their way back to home plate. Of course, the batter, being from the opposing team, hopes that he or she will be rewarded with a trip around the bases, either one at a time or with the crack of a bat, sending the ball over the fence for a home run. Sanctification is like the game of baseball in that we have been freely chosen to play for Christ's team. It's a poor metaphor, but it is a metaphor. We have accepted the call when our parents baptized us, when we come to church every week, we have accepted the call every time we partake of the Lord's Supper. And when we call ourselves to worship, we begin and understand sanctification. When we participate in Sunday morning worship, we are accepting the claim that God has made. We are God's people. With this acceptance, we are offering our willingness to strive to share our gifts and talents with and for Christ Church each and every day. Of course, the ideal game of baseball, like the ideal human life, doesn't really exist. It evaporates shortly after that first batter steps to the plate. You know, often the first batter might be hit by a pitched ball and get to first base. And then he steals second base on a wild pitch. The shortstop drops an easy pop fly, and the runner soars to third. We've all been at those games. Well, if you go to a baseball game. With a simple single to left field, the leadoff hitter finds his way back home. It makes for an inciting inning if you're on the opposing team. It's disappointing if you're on the home team and haven't played your best or just knows that mistakes happen. In baseball, no one bats a 1,000. No pitcher has an ERA, an earn run average of zero if he or she plays on a regular basis. Baseball, like the game of life, is about striving our best while rejoicing our home runs, regretting our errors, and grieving our losses. Baseball is about taking the field the day after a poorly played game and trying again. Baseball is about celebrating teammates for a job well done, as well as honoring opponents when they accomplish an amazing feat. For many people, the game of baseball lost some of its glory over the years as so much money has been poured into the game. And of course now the Astros have been, you know, brought up on charges of technology and cheating. But it's also been binding arbitration, replays, which may alter a call, why, that's ridiculous, and perhaps too many expansion teams. You know, it's not the same, but nothing is the same as it used to be. Once in a while, someone steps forward to restore a bit of glory as they make an impossible catch in midair, as they celebrate a teammate for a job well done, as they offer millions, because they have millions, for others in need, or they rejoice as a team when they have come back from a season well below the 500 mark. You know, this is a small and albeit imperfect illustration of the glory of the sanctification of God in Christ, which calls us to strive each day to use our gifts to the best of our ability. I don't know who our opposing team is. There isn't, you know, it's not like somebody sitting outside but we know evil, in its larger sense, is kind of in opposition to us. Not individual people, but just the fact that even in ourselves, sometimes we want to be greedy and not generous. Sometimes we want to not quite tell the truth. You know, that's really our enemy. It's within. We must try hard, though, to hit our individual home runs, whatever that means for us. At the same time, we must never forget that we are part of a team that is the body of Christ. So our individual home runs really need to help support the larger team. Sharing our resources is a very 
important part of team play. I mean, if you're blessed with prosperity and plenty, God calls us to share those blessings with Christ Church. If you have the gift of teaching, you are called to share that gift with our Sunday school program. If you have the gift of singing, you're, quiet, you're called to share your voice on Sunday morning in the choir or singing out loud from your pew. If you have the gift of hospitality, you are called to share that gift with others. Perhaps offer to do fellowship with a friend. If you feel your gifts are limited by time or health, then simply share that precious gift of prayer or a phone call to connect with someone else because those gifts can heal us all and make us strong. Since it's a new year, we have just installed new officers. We are reconfiguring always our committees, new chairs, etc., and we can always use additional support. We have all types of needs that probably fit your gifts or a gift you might not even know you have yet. In fact, let me tell you about some of the opportunities to serve here at Westmont Presbyterian Church. We have a worship committee that helps plan Sunday morning as well as special services. Our Christian Education Committee serves the needs of education for people of all ages. The members of the Finance and Stewardship Committees have the responsibility to decide how your resources are shared with the congregation and the larger world. Other committees work to nominate new church officers, care for our facilities, and make sure visitors are welcomed each week. Now next week is our annual congregational meeting where the budget will be presented and the ministries of the church are all outlined in our annual report. You might want to read it because it gives good insight into all the activities that make up the ministry of Westmont Presbyterian Church. Because sometimes when you only see certain things, you don't realize how many people it takes to make this happen, even on one Sunday morning. Spend some time this month, month thinking about what area of the church you might like to serve. You might get a call from someone asking to volunteer your services for a special project. If you don't know where you might fit in, you can give me a call or talk to a member of session or a deacon or anybody else you've seen around for a while. We will be more than help you to find a place for your gifts. Remember, we are all, all of us, part of Christ's church. We are all members of the same team, if you will. We've been justified by God's grace in Christ that our lives may be sanctified as we journey forth each day, striving our best to follow where Christ will lead us, because we don't know which way we're going to go. And so again today, let's take the field as we hear God's call to Play ball! And we do all this in the name of the one who has called us and claimed us in Christ. Let us bow heads in prayer. Holy and gracious God, you offer many ways to think about who you are and what we believe. May we continually strive to offer our best gifts to raise up Christ's church here in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. May we also know that your spirit moves in and among us to heal us, to love us, to comfort us and console us so that we all live as your beloved and forgiven people. We pray these things in Jesus' name.